Sean, to that um, uh, you, you can harken back to days before the Civil War when, uh, unfortunately, too many Americans mistakenly believed that not all men were created equal. So what Barack Obama seems to want to do is go back to before those days when we were in different classes based on income, based on uh, color of skin. Why are we allowing our country to move backwards instead of moving forward with that well, understanding that as our charters of liberty spell out for us, mm -hmm. we are all created equally. America's evil genius back with you once again. And what you just listened to at the top of the program were some comments that Sarah Palin made uh, a week or so back on the Sean Hannity program. And these were comments that positively sent the American left into apoplectic fits. These were comments that uh, were so offensive to them, evidently, that none other than the president, his own self, Barack Obama, launched out a campaign ad almost immediately, mocking these comments and deriding them and calling Palin's comments, quoting from the campaign ad here, wrong and dangerous, close quote. Wow, wrong and dangerous? So Sarah Palin basically saying that human beings and Americans should all be uh, viewed on their own individual merits and not viewed as part, of a, as part of a race or part of a socioeconomic class. We should treat each other individually. That idea is wrong and dangerous according to this White House? Wow. To put some historical perspective on this, to, to give us a greater understanding of this, to, to, to see the whole playing field, if you will, let's take a moment to look back at another extremely important historical figure who said something very similar to what Sarah Palin said on the Sean Hannity Show. Hit it. I have a dream. My poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream. That was, of course, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in his uh, very uh, famous and noteworthy I Have a Dream speech in 1963 and saying something that, in my estimation, uh, was very similar to what Sarah Palin said just a couple weeks ago that she's getting so much grief over and that people are, are giving her so much hell about. And I find that stunning and, and sad in a lot of ways that today's Democratic Party and the president himself, Barack Obama, find those comments of Sarah Palin so offensive and it makes me wonder if they find the comments of Dr. King so offensive because I don't see much difference between the two. It makes you wonder what it is about today's Democratic Party that would make them just rush right out and, and castigate someone like Sarah Palin for saying what she said. How could they be so offended at the mere idea that people should be treated uh, on their individual merits, and we shouldn't look at each other in terms of skin color or, or economic class or anything like that. Well, I think the reason that they were so upset about this is because it illustrates something that is very uncomfortable to the modern Democratic Party, something they'll never admit to. But if you look at it closely, you'll see that it's there. What it points out is that Dr. King's words back in 1963, that that idea is exactly what the modern Republican Party is all about. And in that respect, Palin's comments really echo those of Dr. King. However, on the other side of the coin, and the, it's the modern Democratic Party who seems to have moved far away from those ideas. Now, am I telling you that if Dr. King were alive today, he would automatically be a Republican? No, I'm not willing to go that far. That's all speculation, of course. Certainly, King was a Republican back in the 1960s. However, it's clear, if you, if you look at his life, that later on in Dr. King's life, he did uh, have some viewpoints, and he did advocate some things that would be a little troublesome to the modern Republican Party. I mean, at times later in his life, Dr. King uh, expressed uh, a certain level of doubt in, in capitalism. Uh, and he did, at least in one speech, say that America should go to more of a democratic socialism uh, kind of situation. So clearly, there would be things, that, at least in King's beliefs later in his life, that might be stumbling blocks towards him uh, joining the Republican Party today. However, when you go back to that bellwether speech in 1963, the I Have a Dream speech, those ideas, the ideas expressed forth in that speech, the ideas that shaped much of the civil rights movement and much of our nation in the ensuing 50 plus years, it's the Republican Party that's living up to those ideals so much more than the Democratic Party. 
Well, what's the difference? What, what happened to the Democratic Party in the days after King that, that have moved them so radically far away from what most Americans think about race that they would come out and criticize these comments from Sarah Palin that are eerily similar to the comments from Dr. King? What is it that would make this very basic idea so offensive to today's Democratic Party? Well, in my estimation, there has been a consistent strategy from the Democrats when it comes to the African-American community in the last half century. It's a strategy that tries to convince African-Americans that the poverty, the crime, the overall pathology, the challenges, the lack of education, all of those things, the failing schools, all of those challenges that so many African-Americans in our poor communities face, that those challenges are directly related to the long-term racism, bigotry, and alleged unfairness that are inherent in the Democrats' mind to America, that are inherent to the American system. It's making that connection that the challenges that African Americans face are connected to the racism and the bigotry not only of our past, but that they claim is still prevalent today. But is that idea really true? That idea that they have sold African Americans on for a half century, is it really true that the challenges faced in our inner cities, in our urban areas, by our African American community and others are directly related to racism and bigotry? Well, let's look at history and find that out. Let's do some research. Let's look at some stats and let's look at let's let's go back to a period of time that's particularly interesting when bringing up this topic. I want to go back to roughly the era of 1940 to 1960. So in other words, the 20 years almost immediately preceding uh, the Civil Rights Movement, the Great Society, all of those things. The time period where, unfortunately, America was uh, engaged in Jim Crow and segregation and rampant racism and bigotry, a time that I don't think any of us would want to go back to and that we all look upon as, as a black eye on our nation's history. Let's go back to that time and look at a couple of things. Between the years of 1940 and 1960, poverty among black families in that period fell from 87% to 47%. That stat comes from economist Dr. Walter E. Williams. So in that time of tremendous segregation and racism and all of the, the horrible uh, things that happened in that time, black families were still able to escape poverty at a rather rapid rate. Likewise, in the uh, time period of 1936 to 1959, so we're roughly in the same time period there, 1936 to 1959, incomes of blacks when compared to whites, more than doubled during that time period. Again, roughly a couple of decades before the Civil Rights Movement. Also, and that stat incidentally comes from economist Dr. Thomas Sowell. 1940, 86% of black children were born inside marriage. The illegitimacy rate was around 15%. Today, only 31% of black children are born inside marriage. The illegitimacy rate now hovers around 70%. So when you look at those numbers and you look back in history and you line it all up, it does make one scratch your head a little bit. When you're told by the Democratic Party that all of the ills that you see in the urban communities, all of the challenges that the African Americans undertake today and they undergo today are directly related to racism and, and bigotry and so forth, but yet you look at perhaps the most bigoted and racist time in our history and those numbers look so much better for African Americans. Wow. Kind of pokes a real major hole in that story that the Democrats are telling to African Americans, doesn't it? Dr. Walter E. Williams, who I mentioned earlier, summed it up best. And he said in one of his books, and I'm quoting directly from him here, this level of pathology cannot be attributed to discrimination considering that much of it was absent in earlier times when there was far more discrimination, greater poverty, and fewer opportunities, close quote. So essentially, the Democrats have told a story that has largely been a lie for the last 50 years. Democrats have tried to gain the trust of the African American community and have largely done so by convincing them of something that has not been true. And we've just pointed out that it wasn't true. And to be fair, the African-American community is not the only community that the Democrats have tried that with. 
They've tried that with women. They've tried that with Hispanics. They have this tendency to divide and conquer. They have this tendency to try to tell the individual voter that they are instead some part of a greater collective group, that that collective group has some sort of list of access to grind with mainstream American society as a whole, and that instead of assimilating into American society, they should rebel and fight against it. They do it to women, they do it to Hispanics, they do it to gays, they do it to any number of people. It just seems that they've had a far more uh, higher amount of effectiveness with African Americans than others. But see, the difference between the parties in this respect is, is what I'm about to say here. As opposed to Democrats, Republicans are not interested in turning individuals against their own self-interest. We don't want to keep any group of people at a certain level and, and put a glass ceiling above them so that they can't succeed and they'll have to be dependent on us and they'll vote for us forevermore. That's not what we're looking for. But it is largely what a lot of Democrats have looked for. Now, some of you are saying that I'm making an overstatement there. I'm not telling you that every single Democrat who's lived in the last 50 years has undertaken their viewpoint on race or undertaken their viewpoint on the African-American community strictly so that African Americans can be held down in some sort of modern slavery and uh, will we'll keep them in power forevermore. I'm not saying that every Democrat thinks that way. I thoroughly believe that the majority of Democrats out there have pursued these uh, ideas such as the Great Society and Affirmative Action and so forth. I think a lot of Democrats have pers pursued those ideas, flawed as they are, out of the most genuine of intentions, out of the best of intentions. But yet there have been some who have viewed it no more as a way to keep themselves in power. In fact, it was President Lyndon Johnson, who is rather infamous for telling a couple of governors soon after signing the Civil Rights Act in 1964, telling a couple of governors that he'll have those N-words voting for us for 200 years. That's on the record. He said that. So it tells me that that strategy has led at least certain segments of the Democratic Party far away from the ideals that Dr. King advocated in 1963. And instead, it is the Republican Party and Sarah Palin who are far more in line with what Dr. King said in Washington. We do view people as individuals. We do judge people on their own individual merits. We don't think that whether you're an African American or a female or a Hispanic or whatever, whatever other group you want to call yourself, we don't think that you need to subjugate your own interests for some greater interests of your group. We don't believe that. Instead, we believe that everybody should have the opportunity to assimilate into this great society that has enabled so many people to achieve their full potential. We believe African Americans can do that too and Hispanics and women and anybody else you want to name. All we're asking for is for people to stop fighting American society and instead assimilate into it. If you do that, everybody can be successful. That's what today's Republican Party is about. And that's the message that the Democratic Party does not want you to hear if you're a minority in America today, including your president. Instead, President Obama wants to cloud that message and keep you from understanding it. That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. We'll see you next week.